Hey, GW coming to you live once again. Hey, I just... Tomorrow, we're going to review Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Tomorrow, Sunday. But, I wanted to talk to you guys about something that has been bugging me for a while. And it's the Jaws franchise. And... I'll tell you the truth. I love the first film. In fact, I've got the 40th anniversary Blu-ray. And a couple... Well, some reviews back, I showed you guys the picture of the Alex Alex Kittner attack had that had been filmed. And I mentioned about the shark not working and all this and that, right? Then came along Jaws 2. For a sequel, it was almost on par with the original. It was a great film. And at that point, that was in the, the headway of the, or the uh, middle of the Jaws merchandise explosion soon as that number two hit and that did pretty good at the box office you saw jaws t-shirts jaws you know jaws is jaws at they even had a jaws game where they had a shark's head it was about like a big okay and you had to take a hook and pull stuff out on timer and if you didn't guess what jaws would snap up on you then came the abysmal jaws three why was it abysmal? Well, guys, if you haven't done your homework yet, I will tell you. First of all, the film was released in 3D, and it starred Dennis Quaid and Bess Armstrong. The plot this time, guys, was that Jaws, I don't know if you want to say son or daughter, but a great white shark is captured and put into SeaWorld. Things don't go as planned, the shark dies... And here comes Mama to terrorize the SeaWorld, you know, sort of amusement park. And the one thing I will tell you is that up until Jaws 4, Jaws 3 was probably the goriest entry into the series because halfway through the film, viewers were treated to a severed, chomped off head floating right in front of their laps. Yes, it was shot in 3D and it is not very good. They could never duplicate it from what was on the screen to what is actually on your DVD player. Thus, even when the film was made, put on broadcast TV, it was shot in 2D. And it sucked. Not to mention that, you know, when you're a kid, you like this film. You want to be diving in there, going to get Jaws. That's what you pretend, you know, when you're swimming around in swimming pools. But when you take a look at it when you're 30... 35 years old, 40 years old, you know. You take a look at that film and it is not exactly anything that you want to be attached to. The acting was cheap. The one thing, though, I will tell you is that Dennis Quaid, okay, he's in there. You know, that's probably one of the saving graces of the film. Uh, there's another person in there, but I can't. The actor's name escapes me. And he plays Calvin Bouchard, the owner of SeaWorld. He's a very cool guy. That's what the Jaws franchise started to do. They looked it and they got Roy Schneider. And they got Richard Dreyfus, You know, in the first film. And, and the interesting thing is, is in the second one, Richard Dreyfus passed. Because he didn't think it would be a big deal. So his character is... Not seen on screen, but apparently Roy Schneider's character talks to him over the telephone. Wonder what would Jaws 2 be if Richard Dreyfuss actually stayed in it. Could be a whole different film. However, now we're getting back to Jaws 3. Jaws 3 just sank like a pebble. And then jokes started running around, you know... Jaws 4, People 0. You know, they actually were going to make a comedy movie for Jaws 3. It's a known fact. You guys can look it up. Where it was going, Jaws was going to come up out of a kiddie pool, for crying out loud. I mean, it had become a joke in Hollywood, this whole Jaws thing. So anyway, that film flatlined. Then you started to see... You no, know, in fact, when you go back to the original Jaws... That film was so successful, spawned a ton of ripoffs. One of the most notable being Crew Jaws, done by Victor Mattei or Mattei. He's an Italian guy. But anyway, 
it ripped off so much stuff from Jaws that Universal put an injunction against that movie from it ever being seen on a screen. However, bootleg copies made it to the internet and you know how that goes. The interesting thing about that poorly done movie is that it's never the same shark in every scene you see. So in the beginning, it'd be a tiger shark, right? Then you go to the next scene where the shark attacks somebody. It's a mako shark. You know, so it was all these spliced up images. But yeah, Cruel Jaws, look it up. I believe the year is 1975, guys. You can check it out. No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. It came out in the early 80s. And it was the worst shark movie ever. I don't know why I said 70s. I was looking at Texas Chainsaw Massacre over there. But. So anyway, that film sort of paved the way. And then you had all these aquatic movies coming out of the woodwork. So when Jaws 3 sank... And the ending, I want to talk about the ending real quick. The ending of Jaws 3 was supposed to be shot in 3D, like, you know, a couple of the other scenes in the film. But it was also supposed to make the audience feel like Jaws had just exploded on them. So first of all, you pay your money, the movie sucks. And if you only saw it in the, three, in the theater and you got the 3D experience... Then you got, you know, you could say, hey, you know, Jaws blew up on me. They did the same thing, guys, with Friday the 13th Part 3 that was shot in 3D, and they never could duplicate that either because it was anamorphic 3D, I believe they call it, or stereoscopic 3D. But it wasn't the 3D that, you know, you could buy a couple years ago on the TV and stuff would come out at you and you'd have to duck and dodge. It was not that. It was just straight up bad. You don't believe me? Pull the ending of Jaws 3 up from the TV version, and you see how bad it is. So, franchise laid dormant for a while. Then, when I was a kid, I went down to the Penn Theater, and I saw Jaws 4. Why'd I see it? Because I was a kid. I was all into sharks. And the film was great when you're a kid, but this film is the worst, worst, worst film of the franchise and I'm going to tell you guys why. Like I said, when you're a kid, you throw reasoning and and you know, realism out the window when you watch a film. This thing had I'll get I'll tell you what it had going for it. Michael Caine, Mario Van Peebles, a lot of blood, and a cool submarine. Also Lorraine Gary came back and she played Ellen Brody. Now, that's the good part of the film. Here's why it sucks. First of all, they in this film, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Joseph Sargent, who wrote this thing and directed it, actually wanted the shark to have a vendetta against the Brody family. So... Now we're not just dealing with the rogue shark. We're dealing with a psychopathic shark that can survive in warm weather in the Bahamas in water that the shark cannot exist in. So let that saturate for a minute. So if they don't get the basic element of the film right, sharks can't survive in warm water, kill them. It's in the movie, guys. They say it in the movie. Okay? Lance Guest says it in the movie. Who is Lance Guest? He plays Michael Brody in this film. Okay? He says sharks cannot survive in warm water. And what makes the film even worse is that he's an oceanographer. Okay? So now he knows all about this. So right then and there, that sunk the plot of the movie. No matter what happens after that statement, or if you know anything about fish, if you know that, that sinks the rest of the movie. It's all make-believe. It's all garbage. It's all thrown in there because Joseph Sargent had an idea to turn the shark into a killing machine and a serial killer who's going after the Brody family. You, you remember that when you turn it off next time. Just you know, flick it on. So what happens in this film? Well, in the beginning, it's an amity, amity, you know. Sean Brody gets killed, gets his arm ripped off. Good amount of gore, scary death, and it's at night. 
something we've never seen in the Jaws picture. There's a kill at night. We did have a hint of a kill in the first film at night when Ben Gardner's boat gets banged up, but you don't see it. You just see a shark tooth in the aftermath. You saw that. Very cool kill at the beginning, and it racks up the tension. And that's why Ellen Brody just decides to leave Amityville. She goes out to see Michael, who's working in the Bahamas. Now, I've been to the Bahamas, guys. I've been there a few times, and I'll tell you something. There ain't no sharks there. They got stingrays and everything else, but there ain't no sharks. So, <clears throat> that shark that killed her son in Amityville, or Amity, swims all the way to the Bahamas. Think about that as a plot point. There's no way in the world that a shark is going to have a vendetta and travel that far. So that just sunk the plot. One of the coolest things, if anything, this film has going for it, is a submarine chase, much like at the end of the Meg. I think that Meg actually pulled that from it. But anyway, Lance Guest's character is an oceanographer, and he's studying conch. And that's a shellfish, guys. And in one of the scenes, I can't think if it's Mario Van Peebles. I think it is. Mario Van Peebles is the first one to encounter the shark in the submarine, and it's pretty cool. And I wish we could have seen that in earlier films. But the action sequence is just more of them fleeting away from the shark than it is in anything. So then what happens? The shark tries to keep taking out members of Ellen's extended family. And in the final showdown, what does Ellen do? She goes after, commandeers a boat, and goes after the great white shark. In an ending that is actually filmed was changed for TV. It was. It was changed for TV. And they decided that this film was so good, they based a game around it for Nintendo console. Jaws. And you could beat the game in 15 minutes, guys. So you just got a Nintendo back in the day. Games are what? $50, $60 back then? I don't even know. 50 maybe? You buy a $50 game, if you knew what you were doing, you could beat it in 10 minutes. So basically, you paid 50 bucks, but you only got three lives. And you based it off of this crappy movie right here. Jaws, Jaws of Revenge. Now, the reason that I went to see this as a kid is because that Jaws, I, I just like... Jaws. I didn't know anything in the Penn Theater. It was real cheap. I think you could get in for like four and a quarter down there. I also saw Spaceballs down there too. But that was long, long, long time ago. I don't know why they thought this was a good idea of a film. And after part three, they really should have quit. Now, I did read somewhere, and I don't know how well it's in production or what's going on, but they were trying to redo the franchise. They were going to go back to the well, guys, and they were going to start a new Jaws, just like Hollywood has been copying everything because they don't know what they're doing. Well, I'm lying. They do know what they're doing because they do them well. But uh, if they would make Jaws... The way that Jaws should be made. If you read the book, Jaws, it actually has the shark punishing Ellen Brody for an extramarital affair. That's proven fact. That was never in the Universal because they said, look, that's too adult-oriented. We need something to get kids in here. But yet, yet, if that's too adult-oriented, you look at the first scenes of Jaws 1. There's a naked woman running down the beach. And if you pause it right, you could see some stuff you probably weren't meant to see. But it was pretty cool how they filmed that scene, and they did it in the dark, and it was pretty cool. So if you ever get to want to know that, you get the Jaws Blu-ray, the 40th anniversary edition, you'll check it out. So, 
What do I say about Jaws 4? And this is the only Jaws movie, too, that... Jaws attacks a plane. In part two, he attacked a helicopter, so they must have wrote that in the script. You know, shark attacks helicopter, shark attacks plane. Cruel Jaws ripped this off, too. Well, no, they didn't rip this one off, but they ripped part two off. When you watch this stupid thing... It, like I said, if you know anything about it, it doesn't make a lick of sense. The only other thing to tell you, it's the goriest one of the bunch. There's blood that runs all over everything. There's a attack on a banana boat scene that's pretty wicked. It's reminiscent of the first film when Alex Kintner got it on the raft. You know, there is a... I'm trying to think. There's a couple other attacks that are pretty wicked but this one is a pg-13 why is it 13 because apparently this is more intense than the first film and i want to ask you guys something how can anything be more intense in the first film when the first film scared the hell out of everybody to even go near a pool a lake or even in your bathtub or a swimming pool because psychologically, that was a very, very frightening idea to put in the kid's head. Or anybody, for that matter. You'd be swimming in the ocean, all of a sudden, underneath you comes this great white shark, pulls you down, and that's it. So, my point is, in 1975, when Jaws was released. Okay, or 19, it was 1975, right? Okay. How is that more intense than this one, which was made in 1987. Somehow I thought it was 91. I think it's PG because of the intensity as well as the blood. I think there's a little bit more blood in here, but who am I to judge? But I just caught the tail end of the movie, and it makes me laugh all the time that, you know, as a grown man sitting here, you're going, yeah, you're right. Shark in warm water, no. So, I, I don't even know where to go with this thing other than that. Um, the endings were, like I said, were slightly changed from TV. Because I remember seeing the one on the original video. In fact, it was actually changed on video too. And when they aired it on TV, they kept all the blood and gore. They added the extra ending. But they also kept the profanity. Interesting. But again, you know, watch this thing. I, I don't really know who thought that was a good idea. If it were me and I was directing this fourth movie, what I would do is bring it back full circle to Amity and have everything just calm down, right? And take the vendetta and the psychoness out of the shark. I would have everything calm down in Amityville or Amity, I keep saying Amityville because I'm thinking of the Amityville horror. But I would have everything calm down in Amity. And I would have them build like a new bridge or something, right? And slowly people start getting picked off and Chief Brody's still around. And you have him investigate. And once he finds out he's a shark, you call Richard Dreyfuss's character, Matt Hooper in. And then you go from there. You know, Quint's already dead. So we already know that he's not coming back for the sequel if I were to do it. Right? And you make the attacks. Because you know the audience knows what's coming. You make them bloodier and you make them shocking. Just like in Deep Blue Sea. When Sam Jackson was sitting there rallying the troops and that shark come up and just grabbed him and pulled him up under the water. You remember that? Yeah. That's what I would do. I would have a lot of jump scares in that film. Maybe about three or four. You don't want to overdo it. But Jaws 4... You know, if you can find it in a bargain bin for $4.99, I say buy it. But other than that, watch it on TV. It's shown a lot during the summer. You know, especially on Fox and, you know, TBS. They like to run all this stuff. But I just had to get this out of my system. Because this is a film that when I was a kid, I even read the book. I, I really liked it. But then... Like I said, whenever I watch it again, I mean, it, it just, 
it's an embarrassment on so many levels. And you can tell these people are really trying with what they got. They had good ideas. And, you know, Michael Caine, he did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels after this film. I don't even think he wants to be remembered for this film. Mario Van Peebles went, went on to create a Western film called Posse, you know, which is pretty cool. He's been, I think he was in New Jack City as well. You know, I'm not sure. Maybe that was Ice-T. But he was in a couple of movies after this. You know, but uh, yeah, Jaws 4, not a great landmark. And even the video game, if you look up how badly the video game was done, not good. I'll try to put some screenshots down there of it. But like I said, when you're a kid, you know, it's like, dude, you know, Jaws 4 is on 8 o'clock. Yeah, in the first five minutes, that guy gets his arm ripped off. We cannot miss it. So you go home, you watch it. And after that, you're treated to a mundane, by-the-number shark attack film that doesn't make a lick of sense because Lance Gaston says, in the movie, sharks cannot survive in warm water. Therefore, it negates the whole movie, and that's my two cents on it. And I'm sorry I spent 20 minutes talking about it, but I just had to get this out. So like I said, tomorrow night, or even Sunday morning, I will review Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. It's Guillermo de Toro. He did The Orphanage. And he did Pan's Labyrinth, which was amazing. And it's based off the books by Stephen Gamble and Al Alvin Schwartz. So we're going to see how good it is. And I used to read them books when I was a kid. So we'll see how closely they follow the material. It's GW. And that was looking back at Jaws 4. <laughs>